So I have watched both seasons of Netflix Barbarians, and the first one was good and the second one was terrible. I thought about making one big video on both seasons, but the second one is so much worse than the first that I decided not to mix them up and review them separately. I'm going to talk mostly about the historicity of the characters and the events, a little bit about the setting, and will also add some comments on the choices that the writers made. If you haven't yet watched the show, there are going to be heavy spoilers ahead for season 1. Before going into the events of the show, we should get a wider historical picture of the setting. Why were the Romans in Germania? When did they arrive east of the Rhine? And what were they trying to accomplish there? Rhine became the frontier between the Romans and the Germanic tribes after the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar. When Augustus came into power, one of his first orders of business was pacification and integration of the new province of Gallia. The Germans, in the meantime, were proven to be very unpleasant neighbors. They supplied the Gallic rebels during their uprisings, raided across the Rhine, and were overall a huge nuisance. In 17 BC, a Roman legion under the command of Marcus Lollius got ambushed and destroyed by a Germanic raiding party. The legion's standard was captured and taken beyond the Rhine. Despite the fact that the eagle was returned the next year, Augustus decided that Germania needed to be pacified, conquered, and incorporated into the empire. His plan was to have the river Elbe as Rome's northeastern border. From 12 BC, emperors adopted son Drusus led four campaigns beyond the Rhine. When he died in an accident in 9 BC, his brother Tiberius took up charge of the Rhine legions and continued the conquest of Germanic lands. Despite a few minor setbacks, the campaigns were deemed an overall success. Roads were built and military holdings were constructed to facilitate the integration of the land. To complete the conquest and fully pacify the Germans, Tiberius was planning a huge military operation with the full force of his 11 legions. However, before he could start his offensive, a revolt in Pannonia broke out, which required his immediate attention. In 6 AD, Tiberius took 8 of his 11 legions and moved them southeast to quell the uprising. In his absence, a senator Publius Cunctilius Varus was appointed a governor of the newly created province of Germania and was given control of the remaining three legions. And this is where the events of the show start. Let's figure out how historically accurate the show is by going over its characters. A good portion of them represent actual historical figures, or at least share a name with one. Out of the main cast, only Falkwin is purely fictional. Various chieftains were also invented for the show, except for Segemer. Segemer was a real chief of the Cheruski, or Cheruski, and was heavily involved in Roman-Germanic relations. The show portrays Cheruski as just another tribe, very small even, huddling together in a couple of huts. In reality, Cheruski was one of the most powerful tribes of the region. In 11 BC, a Cheruski army, led probably by Segemer himself, ambushed Drusus with his forces and almost dealt him a crushing defeat. When Tiberius came to govern the region, he struck a deal with Segemer. Cheruski were to become the main Roman strategic partner and to be exempt from the tribute. To secure their cooperation, Tiberius took some of the children of the Cheruski elite to be fostered in the empire. The Roman strategy here had two purposes. Not only were those children valuable hostages, they were also meant to be future agents for the integration of the tribes into the imperial fold. They were brought up in Rome, later to return to their native land, where they would act as intermediaries between the two societies. By this arrangement, both sons of Segemer were taken to Rome, which is also depicted in the show. One of the boys is of course the main character of the show, Arminius. The story of him and his brother being taken to Rome is dramatized for the purpose of the narrative. They most certainly weren't adopted by Varus, but the writers needed to create a narrative of Arminius as a man torn between two worlds, so this change is justified artistically. Arminius has the most famous story out of all the characters. He was taken to Rome at a young age, served in the Roman army, and earned a citizenship and equestrian rank. He joined Varus in Germania in 7 AD, together with his Cherusca cavalry. At some point, Arminius decided to betray Rome. He gained the trust of Varus while secretly working to establish a coalition of multiple tribes, presumably together with his father. At one point, he convinced Varus to quarter small groups of Roman soldiers in tribal settlements, only to have them later killed or imprisoned 
when the final stage of his plot was unveiled. Finally, in 9 AD, when the legions were moving into winter quarters, Arminius persuaded Varus to take a detour through the unfamiliar land under the pretext of quelling a tribal revolt. He lured the army into a massive ambush, where the legions were completely destroyed in a battle that lasted three days. Show Arminius follows almost all of these story bits, although they are compressed to fit the series' format. The writers even give some attention to the Cherusky auxiliaries, but their command is given to the character Talio. Another thing to mention is that his plan wasn't hastily put together in a couple of weeks, but was many months or even years in the making. The portrayal of Varus is also pretty good. Historians characterize him as a capable administrator, whose main fault was his trust toward Arminius. The show relies on the accounts of Cassius Dio in describing the cause of the revolt. Varus is accused of getting carried away as the governor, thinking that the Germans are already subdued and overtaxing them. In the show, the conflict is started by the Romans breaking the previous treaty and demanding the tribute from Cherusky. Just like his historical counterpart, at the end of his story, Show Varus decides to fall on his sword after being lured into an ambush. Before this, he ignores the warnings of Segestus, who is also a historical person. Segestus has probably the least flattering portrayal in the show. Roman historians describe him as a man of a mighty stature, confident in his unwavering loyalty. Real-life Segestus led a pro-Roman faction of the Cherusci, and openly opposed the Arminius, on one occasion even meeting him in battle. The show portrays him as a sniveling coward and a traitor, who sells out his people to be on the winning side. Historically, even after the German victory at Teutoburg, Segestus refused to join Arminius. Here's what Tacitus writes about this. Segestus, though drawn into the war by the unanimity of his nation, was still irreconcilable with Arminius, who aggravated the personal feud between them by carrying off his daughter, although she was betrothed to another. The aforementioned daughter, Thusnelda, is one of the main characters. She shares the name with the real Segestus' daughter, about whom we know quite little. The account of Tacitus is a clear inspiration for the plot, and show Thusnelda also marries Arminius, breaking her previous betrothal. The writers made her to be one of the driving forces of the rebellion. Roman historians also describe her as brave because of her later conduct in Roman captivity, but there are no hints of her active participation in the events leading to the battle. Shothus Nelda is a well-written character, but most of the details of her story are fictional. She also has a brother called Ansgar, who looks around 11 years old. Real-life son of Segestus was called Segemund and was much older. There was no incident of him being crippled by a Roman soldier. Instead, like Arminius, he also served in the Empire, however not as a soldier, but as a priest in the imperial cult of Augustus. When the rebellion broke out, he abandoned his service to join Arminius, but later switched sides back to help his father. So when it comes to the characters and the events, the show strikes a decent balance between accuracy and entertainment. I had no big grabs with any of the portrayals, except Segestus. His cowardice and treachery is too on the nose, especially considering what we know about his historical prototype. I also liked most of the sets and costumes. Armor, shields and weapons of the Roman soldiers are accurate to the period. There are some usual shortcuts, like the use of stirrups, but overall there is very little to complain about. One detail that I really liked is Arminius' face mask. He wears it on and off throughout the series. As the final battle commences, he removes his mask and throws it away. A mask identical to it has actually been found by archaeologists near the battle site, so I think it is a very nice detail. The Germanic tribesmen look decent as well. I even checked if the plate patterned cloaks worn by some of them could exist in the 1st century AD, and surprisingly found out that they could. The textiles with this pattern, called Tartan, were found in an archaeological site in Austria. They belong to the Hallstatt culture, which is linked to the Celts rather than the Germans. But it's not beyond belief that some similar textiles were made in Germania. The representation of the Roman military camp has both good and bad aspects. I think they are basing it on the Aliso camp near modern-day Haltern, which was actually the last point of Roman resistance in Germania after the Battle of Teutoburg. The town of Haltern has a whole museum dedicated to it, so we can compare its exhibits with the elements of sets in the show. As you can see, tents and the camp layout look very similar. 
What's bad about the camp's depiction is that there are no proper walls, and there's woods right outside of the perimeter. Lack of walls may be written off as a budget issue, but they could have at least CGI'd a bigger clearing between the fence and the trees. This unwalled camp, located right next to the forest, just invites a night attack. It is unclear why Arminius even had to lure the Romans somewhere, when he could have just as easily ambushed them while they were asleep in the camp. The final battle is condensed from a three-day slog to a quick massacre. They've also added some kind of fire trap visual effects. There are no accounts of anything similar, but it sure looks nice on the screen. I had a very positive impression of the first season of this show, in no small part because of its decent historical accuracy. The things that they changed are for the most part well justified by it being historical drama and not a documentary. The show has an obvious political narrative about German nationalism, but it doesn't interfere too much with the portrayal of the events. This season isn't a masterpiece by any means, but it has a coherent plot and interesting historical characters, so if you like this period of Roman history, it can be a good five hours of television. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about the second season, which I am going to cover in the next video. For my analysis, I used four different primary sources, and a modern book by Peter Wells called The Battle That Stopped Rome. You can check it out if you want to learn more about the battle itself and its participants. Next time we are going to talk about the absolute disappointment that is season 2. But for now, thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you in the next one.